Good evening. It's time to start our service this evening. I want to take this opportunity to, to welcome everyone here this evening. Uh, welcome anyone who may be uh, watching uh, online tonight. Uh, we're going to continue on with our lesson uh, from year four, book one, and our lesson tonight will be a continuation of lesson seven, Christ our High Priest and Atoning Sacrifice. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, Melinda and Tim uh, went to Nashville today where Melinda had another treatment, uh, but Tim uh, thought that he needed to stay home with her this evening. So let's remember them. And uh, I understand that Judy Jackson uh, is going to be placed uh, under hospice care. So let's, let's remember uh, the Jackson family. And uh, Lynn Miller is worshiping with uh, uh, one of the groups in Athens this evening. So that, that explains he, why he's not here. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, before we get started, Gary, you're going to lead us in a word of prayer, please. Go for it, Billy. Well, that's true, and we may we may touch on some of that tonight. I tell you, there's pretty severe consequences. Pretty severe. Yes. All right. Let's do just a little bit of, of review. I won't go through everything. We're in Levit Leviticus, and as our book calls it, a book for priest. Starts out with a quote from Leviticus 19, chapter 2, or Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. You shall be holy for the Lord your God, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We know that the Israelites have been delivered from Egypt and safely crossed the Red Sea. The Israelites have been redeemed from slavery and set apart from other nations. God wanted them to be holy and gave them His laws and statutes, teaching them to live righteously before Him. The book of Leviticus covers about one month, and it gives us uh, the chapter from Exodus 40, verse 17 to Numbers 1 1. 
in the wilderness of Sinai and is crucial to the future of Israel and to the priest who would make intercession for their sins. It is also crucial to our understanding of Christ's sacrificial blood and his role as our high priest. God chose Aaron and his sons from the family of Levi to be the first priest, Exodus 27, 21 through 28, 1. However, mediating for the people in their sinful state was quite a huge responsibility for men who were imperfect themselves. They would need to know exactly how to perform their responsibilities as priest, for this was a role of life and death. Leviticus is a sort of manual for the priest, instructing them in the ways of purification for themselves and for others, or for themselves and the Israelites. And we talked about the sons of Aaron, the laws for sacrifice. Leviticus chapter 1 through 7 teaches us about the sacrifices. There are five different types of offerings listed. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. And Sunday morning, uh, Tim was able to cover uh, all of those uh, except the last one, the trespass offering. And that's, that's where we're going to start at tonight. Uh, we'll be on page 50 for those of you who have uh, the workbooks, and I'm just kind of kind of run through here. I couldn't figure out any way to get there faster than this. All right, the trespass offering. Uh, the book starts out here. A trespass is an unlawful act or sin. It was unlawful for a person to touch any unclean thing pertaining to animals or humans. Speaking thoughtlessly, lying to a neighbor, and keeping what was not his were all trespasses. For all of these, the priest would accept the appropriate offering and make atonement for sin. And as I was first going through this, I thought, well, there's not a lot of difference between the trespass offering or the guilt offering, as some of your versions will use the term, and the sin offering. So I started, uh, I started looking into it a little more, and I've got, I've got several things here I'd like to read. Uh, and I don't know if it'll help you or not. It, it kind of helped me a little bit. It says, the definition of trespass, any unlawful act or sin, overlaps in our language with the word sin. However, there was a difference between the trespass offering and the sin offering in the old law. And you, you saw that as, as you read through the chapters. Even comparing different translations of Leviticus 5, 6, the wording seems confusing. And here are some examples of that from the New King James Version. He shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed as a sin offering. The New American Standard Bible reads, he shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord as a sin offering. The English Standard Version reads, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed for a sin offering. They're, they're very close. Erdman's Bible Handbook on page 172 says, the relationship between the sin offering and the guilt offering is not clear. Generally speaking, the sin offering seems to have references to offenses against God and the guilt offering to social offenses. But even sin against others is seen as a sin against God. Leviticus 6.2 says this, when a person sins and acts unfaithfully against the Lord, there's a sin against the Lord, 
and deceives his companion in regard to a deposit or a security entrusted to him, or through robbery, or if he has exhorted from his companion, there's a sin against a fellow man. Several specific situations that require a trespass offering are described in Leviticus 5, 14, and 19, and also in number 6. Truth Commentary on Leviticus by Blackmore summarizes by saying, the scriptures nowhere explain why those particular situations require a trespass offering, whereas many other situations did not. But if we boil it all down, the thing that we need to remember is that whatever God had specified, that's what they had to do. They had to do it the way that God said. The sacrifice that was offered for these specific things had to be exactly the way God wanted it to be offered. Because if it wasn't, it wasn't right. And, and, and for me, that's, that was the, the main thing to take away from this. The question was asked, what would the priest do with the blood? And this is the trespass offering. And here's what it says in verse 9. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. The book continues. We've only briefly inspected these sacrifices but they were clearly bloody and burdensome. Many more details are given as to how Aaron and his son, sons were to handle the offerings, but the point is God was to be, to be obeyed in all things and in every way. As we continue the study of sacrifices, remember the one who died in order to put an end to the old law and its endless requirement of blood of animals, the sacrifices had to be repeated over and over again. And we're going to refer to this passage several times, but Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4 says this, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offered continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sin, year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now before we move away from, from these sacrifices a little bit, a couple things I'd like us to remember and think about. First of all, as we mentioned uh, briefly Sunday, the, the very personal aspect of all of these sacrifices. The person that was bringing the sacrifice couldn't bring this sacrifice to the, to the, to the uh, opening of the courtyard and hand it over to the priest and then go about their business. They took the animal into the courtyard. They laid their hands on the animal as its throat was sit, slit and its blood was shed for the sin that they had committed. The person that had brought the sacrifice then had, uh, I can't think of a more, any other way to put it, but that person had the responsibility to butcher the animal then and to hand the priest the pieces that were to be offered as a sacrifice. You know, there was a lot of blood to be dealt with. After the sacrifice was made, the individual 
uh, in some cases had the responsibility to finish skinning the animal and, and dress what we use the term dressing it out. And then they had the responsibility to remove the animal from the courtyard. And I, they couldn't just, you know, take it outside the gate of the courtyard or the tabernacle and they were done with it. They had to transport it to a place outside the camp, a place that had been specifically set forth for that. And remember now, the tabernacle was set right in the center of this huge encampment of the Israelites. There was a lot of personal involvement in this sacrifice. But another thing we have to see is this shows us the purpose of the bronze laver. Because the priest had to clean their hands and they had to clean their feet before they went in to the holy place and before they, they did other things. So the picture that we see of the complete tabernacle in the courtyard is not the tabernacle surrounded by the, 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 the uh, curtains of the courtyard and this prisontine white sand covering everything. That wasn't what this looked like. And I think, I think it's important that we remember that. Comments. I think it's when you, it was a bloody place. I don't care how you look at it. It had to have been a awful but bloody place. Yes. Yes. A, a, a lot of blood. All right. Let's continue. Yes, Virginia. Yes, there was a lot of people. It, it, there had to be. If you just, if you, like I say, you think about, well, one of the numbers that the author used was more than two million people that left Egypt. This was a, this was a continually, continuing, ongoing practice. Uh, I, I, just, I just, given the people involved and the, the space involved in the tabernacle, it just, it just went on endlessly all unless they were traveling. All right, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. Now for many of us, the story of Nadab and Abihu is something that we've, we've looked at many times, but let's, let's remind ourselves. In ceremonial style, Aaron and his sons were consecrated to the service of the tabernacle. They were washed, dressed in priestly garments, and anointed. Moses made an offering of atonement for them and put the blood on the, on the tips of their right ears, right thumbs, and big toes of their right feet, similar to how the vessels of the tabernacle had been sprinkled with blood. According to Leviticus chapter 8, 35, this is a question, how long were the priests to stay inside the tabernacle following their consecration and why? Seven days and nights. Okay, seven days and nights and why? So that they would not die. So that they would not die. All right. Now, after Aaron offered atoning sacrifices for himself and for the people, he lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them. Review the facts. Read Leviticus 9, uh, 23 through 10, 7. And let me find my notes here. Oh, as I was reading through this, and no one else may have had a problem with this but me. As I was reading through this section, I kept reading a reference to the tent of meeting. Now, we know, no, we know that Moses had a tent of meeting that was set up outside the camp. And the Israelites come to him and, and different issues was taken care of. This is another example to me of how we always have to be careful of the context 
and, and, and pay attention to the context of what we're reading. Because when we read about this tent of meeting and we read about the, the altar of burnt offerings set up in front of it, that tells us that that is not Moses' tent of meeting. When we read this term here, we're talking about the tabernacle, what we normally refer to the tabernacle. All right, number one, what appeared to all the people here? The, the glory of the Lord. Uh, let me get to my, from chapter 9 of verse 23. What came out from before the Lord? Fire. Okay. What did it consume? Okay, the burnt offering and the fat that was on the altar. And what did the people do when they saw this? Shouted and fell on their faces. Kind of the same reaction we've seen when the Moses, when, when the Lord descended on Mount Sinai. And the people said, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to talk to the Lord anymore. You know, Moses, you talk to the Lord and tell us what he said. They shouted and they fell on their faces. Now, what kind of fire did Nadab and Abihu offer before the Lord? Okay, a strange fire or a profane fire which the Lord had not commanded. And I think it's important. This is all the information we have about this. Number six, how did they die? Okay, fire come, fire, fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. Now we have a fill in the blank from Leviticus 10.3. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, near me I will be what? Treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. Uh, possibly, I'm not sure uh, if it all, if this was all part of one event or not. Uh, I mean, when we read it, yes, there's no break there. All right. Uh, after Moses spoke these words, Aaron kept silent. He had just lost his two eldest sons, but even in his grief. Aaron evidently understood that his sons had not treated the Lord as holy. Moses warned Aaron, Eliezer and Ithmar, now remember, Eliezer and Ithmar was, was Aaron's two remaining sons, not to mourn in the customary manner, nor even to leave the tabernacle because the anointing oil was upon them. They were to be separated from the people. Mishael and Elzapaz carried the burnt bodies of Nahab and Abihu outside the camp, and all of Israel mourned the burning which the Lord kindled. Now, read Leviticus 10, 8 through 11, and we've got some questions following it. What did the Lord tell Aaron in verse 9. Okay. Do not drink wine nor intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. But also, he said, and this, 
I know this question didn't refer us to this verse, the next one does, but this is what verse 10 says. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Now, we've answered this question, what did the Lord tell Aaron in verse 9, and why was he told this? Okay, so that you may be distinguished between holy and unholy and between clean and unclean. And then the author asked us to think here uh, with this question. Does drinking impair one's judgment? And yes, absolutely it does. And then she asked us, Do you think this is an interesting statement following the behavior and death of Nadab and Abihu? Abihu. Why or why not? Anyone like to anyone like to answer the why part of this? Okay, all right. How about the why not? Okay. Okay. We do not know, we do not know that if drink had anything to do with their decision to use the strange or the profane profane fire. We do know this, that they did not distinguish between that which was holy and unholy. And we've seen the consequences of that. I think it's important even a lesson that we can learn today from this and from that act is God expects us to give the way absolute. We have to understand that. The other thing that we need to glean from this Okay. They, they, there, should, there shouldn't be anything in their system, in their body, or anything else. If they give these to great details of how clean they were supposed to be, the washing of their feet, hands, all that, how their garments were supposed to be spotless, all, all, all those things were, were, but also inwardly, they were to be pure and clean. And that, that whole part of that is, is something that we need to And they didn't do it. That's that's right. That's right. If I may, to follow up on what Tim said, we tend to use Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10 a lot, but we rarely get the running jump pad that the scripture has. The story starts in chapter 8 with the eight days of consecration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you start reading in chapter 8, I'm not going to take everybody's time to do that, but just point out a couple very beginning in chapter 8 with the consecration in verse 4 at the end of that little paragraph which is kind of a summary at the beginning it says Moses did just as the Lord commanded then there was a commandment about the washing of the dress and in verse 9 says that Moses did just as the Lord commanded and then you get to the next thing at the end of that paragraph in verse 13 just as the Lord commanded Moses and at verse 17 offered the bull, just as the Lord commanded Moses. And every paragraph in chapters 8 and 9 ends with that, they did just what the Lord commanded. And then you get to chapter 10 and it says they offered fire which the Lord had not commanded. It stands out like a sore 
And, and, and this also, following last week, we talked about how precise all the directions for was building the tabernacle. They were shown exactly what they were supposed to do. As we mentioned last week, there was a right way, there was God's way, and there was a wrong way. And, Anything else? Okay, let's move on then. On page 52 in your books, we see this uh, chart of the genealogies. And, you know, I'll ask you to, you know, pay attention to Levi and his sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Marie. I'll pronounce that. We're going to see these, these names again next week. Lord willing, when we look at the way the encampment was set up around the tabernacle, because these families all played a specific part in the erection and transport uh, of the tabernacle. We follow Kohath's family down. We see Amram. We see his children, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. Aaron is who we've been talking about here as the high priest. We see Aaron's uh, sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And then over to your right, under the family of uh, Uz Uzeli, we see uh, Mishael and Eliphaz, who was the ones that carried out, uh, carried the bodies of Nadab and Abihu uh, out of the camp. All right, get ready, Billy. All right, find Mishael and Eliphaz on the chart and circle them. Were they descendants? And the question, which we kind of already answered, were they descendants of Levi? Yes, yes they were. Were they priests? No. no, they weren't. Why not? They weren't descendants of Aaron. They weren't descendants of Aaron. Okay. All right, laws for living. Leviticus 11 through 15 deals with practical laws for everyday life. The Israelites were to be clean in the sight of the Lord. This included their food, their bodies, houses, garments, and belongings. The laws were quite detailed in how to deal with any uncleanness, just as detailed as we've seen everything up to this point. The priests were to teach and assist the people in purification, especially in cases of disease, and, and leprosy is, is, is mentioned here. The process for cleansing involved, one, that of time, okay, uh, from Leviticus 13, 15, then the, who, the priest, shall look at the mark and shall quarantine the article with the mark for how many days? For seven days. All right, so we have a time element. We have a fire element. So he, this is the priest, shall burn the garment uh, in which the mark occurs, for it is a leprous malignancy. It shall be burned in the fire. There was a water element. But if the priest shall look, and indeed the mark has not spread in the garment, 
the who, the priest, shall order them to wash the thing which the mark occurs, and he shall be, and it shall, and he shall quarantine it for seven more days. Okay. Further laws on practical living are given at the end of the book, including laws on lending and slavery. The Jews were to religiously keep these laws and teach them to their children. By the days of the New Testament, the Jews had been living under these laws for some 1,500 years. And I want us to pause and think now about all these sacrifices that we've studied and how many sacrifices were offered in 1,500 years. It, it just, it's just unimaginable. Unimaginable. But then one sacrifice made it all good. It continues. It is no wonder that they had trouble accepting the changes brought about in Christ. And then the author says, remember when Peter was told to eat unclean animals. Our next section, section search the scriptures. Read Leviticus 11, 1 through 8, and verses 13 through 19. And then uh, in Acts 10, uh, verses 9 through 16, we have this, uh, this incident with Peter. It says, list some of the animals described as unclean in Leviticus. And let me just run all through these and I think we'll hit, if it's not on your list, we'll deal with it then. How does that sound? Those who chew the cud or have a divided hoof was, complete, was considered a, a clean animal. A cow would be a clean animal. Okay, uh, Goats, sheep. Okay, But then we have this start of listing of unclean animals. The camel chews the cud, but not divided hoof. The rock hydrax, or rock rabbit, or coney, or some of your vers versions use another term here. Chews the cud, but does not have a divided hoof. A rabbit chews the cud, but no divided hoof. A pig has a divided ho hoof, but does not chew the cud. Anything in the water with no fins and scales was considered unclean. Pardon? <laughs> no catfish. Okay. Eagles, vultures, buzzards, the red kite, the falcon, raven, ostrich, owl, seagull, hawk, little owl, comorant, great owl, white owl, pelican, a carrion vulture, stork, heron, hopo, bat, all winged insects that walk on all fours or anything like that. Animals that walk on, on four paws, it has. Mole, mouse, the great lizard, the gecko, the crocodile, the lizard, the sand reptile, the chameleon, every swarming thing Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever crawls on all fours, whatever has many feet. Those are the unclean things that you could not eat under the old law. Now, we're asked the question. We switch over to the New Testament here. Peter, a devout Jew, had a vision. What animals were in this vision, in his vision? Okay, unclean animals, and we're, we're going to be able to, to, we know that because of Peter's uh, answer. You know, again, this is, a, this is a, a, an account that we've all studied many times. Many of us from when we were very little about Peter being on the housetop and seeing this vision of the, 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 a sheet-like thing coming down, and it's full of, anim and it's full of animals. And uh, all kinds of animals in this. 
Number three says, when Peter was told to arise and eat, what did he say? Okay, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So that tells us what was in, what was the animals that were pictured in this vision. Number four, what was God's response in verse 15? That's right, that's right. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Uh, let me catch up with myself here a little bit. Yes, we don't have any, I do, I do not believe that we have any dietary restrictions on us today. <laughs> Let's continue. All right. No, of course, we understand that Acts 10 records a very significant event. Approximately seven to nine years after the church was established at Acts 2, the good news of Christ was now to be preached to the Gentiles who were formerly thought of as unclean by the Jews. Laws for moral purity and we're on if you have a workbook and following along we're on page 53 now. <clears throat> The Day of Atonement is instituted in chapter 16, by which the nation of Israel is cleansed spiritually. In Leviticus 17, we learn why blood is necessary for spiritual cleansing. For the life of the, of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood of by reason of life that makes atonement, and the King James Version adds, for the soul. Now, we've got another, we've got another fill in the blank here. Uh, from Hebrews 9.22, and according to the law, almost all things are cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Okay, in chapter 18 marriage between close relatives is outlawed in chapter 18 verse 6. Up to this point it was allowed and we're given the example of Abraham marrying his sister Sarah now, it was Sarah's, it was Sarah's, Sarah was Abraham's half-sister. Uh, Moses' mother uh, married her nephew. Okay. This was now to be considered sexually immoral, along with other acts of perversion, such as homosexuality. And if you uh, have not taken the time yet, uh, I would encourage you to read uh, chapter 18 and, and, and note all the things that was listed there. We won't, we won't do that right now. They were also reminded not to turn to idolatry in verse 20. The Lord wanted them to be different from the other nations in Canaan who commonly practiced idolatry and the immorality that accompanied it. He wanted them to be holy as He is holy. And unfortunately, we will see when they get to the land of Canaan that they did not follow those instructions all the time. But that's, that's for another lesson. Okay, read Leviticus 21, 17 through 24 concerning the priest. And our first question is, who could not be a priest? Okay, well that's one answer. Anyone who wasn't a descendant of Aaron, and that's, that's a good part. What's the other thing we're looking for here? Oh, I'm sorry? No defects. Okay, I heard Gary back there. No defects. Uh, anyone with an impairment, 
or some versions use the word defects. Some people use the term, uh, some versions use the term blemish. Okay, and then our, and, and our second question is, uh, what were some of these defects? And Sunday, you know, Rohan asked the question about, uh, you know, what constituted a blemish in, in a sacrifice, in an animal, and, and I made the comment, well, we've got a list of what was a blemish and it kept the person from being a high priest. Okay, and here was, here was the list that, that Tim come up with. They could not be blind, limp, uh, have a slit nose, broken foot, broken hand, contorted back, a dwarf, a spot in the eye, festering rash or scabs, or crushed testicles. From Leviticus 21, verses 16 through 24, this is, what, this is what it reads. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your offspring throughout their generations who has a defect shall approach to offer the food of his God. For no one who has a defect shall approach a blind man or a lame man or he who has a disfigured face or any deformed limb or a man who has a broken foot or broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or one who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scabs or crushed testicles. No man among the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect is to come near to offer the Lord's offerings by fire, since he has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat, of, he may eat the food of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy, only he shall not go into the veil or come near the altar because he has a defect, so that he will not profane my sanctuaries. For I am the Lord, who sanctifies them. So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons and to all the sons of Israel. And then we're asked this question again, of whom were the priests to be descended? And we know of Aaron. Okay. Pardon? No, no. Exactly, exactly. They are, they are. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Okay. All right. The feast days are outlined in chapters 23 and chapter 24. Further instructions for the care of the tabernacle are given along with more personal instructions for the common man. What does Leviticus 24.20 say about personal injury? It says, it says, Fracture for fr fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he has caused disfigure disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. But now I want to read a little on both sides of this. This is from Leviticus 24, and I'm going to start in verse 17 and read through 22. If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. The one who takes the life of an animal shall make it good, life for life. If a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Verse 20, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. Thus the one who kills an animal shall make it good. But the one who kills a man shall be put to death. There shall be one standard for you 
It shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. And, you know, this is kind of what Billy touched on earlier. Uh, if this same standard was used today, there would probably be a lot of changes. Let's continue. But what does Jesus say in Matthew 5, 38 through 39? To turn the other cheek. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Laws for Sabbath rest. The number seven, and I believe we're on page uh, 54 now in the workbooks. The number seven is used throughout God's dealings with man as a symbol of completeness. The Lord created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. Therefore, the Israelites were to remember the seventh day every week as holy unto the Lord. From Exodus 20, verse 8. This theme of the Sabbath is extended to every seventh year for the land to rest. Furthermore, they were to count seven times seven years of Sabbath, Sabbaths, uh, seven times seven, equaling the 49th year from 25 8. In that year, the tenth day of the seventh month would be the Day of Atonement when they were to blow the trumpet throughout their land and consecrate the 50th year as a holy year, uh, the year of Jubilee. They were to proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants from 2520. Among other things, they were not to do any work of the field in this year as well. The Lord promised to provide so they would have no need during these years of rest. And we're asked the question, what did he provide every sixth day in the wilderness so they could rest on the seventh day? Okay, a double portion of manna. Uh, manna enough for two days from Exodus 16, verse 5. And we know also that this double portion would not spoil or rot, unlike if they collected manna on one day and attempted to keep some of it for the second day. Not work not worked not worked in any fashion. And and I I I don't know. It certainly, if it was a good enough practice for the Israelites, I would say it would be a good enough practice for today. All right. God promised His newly redeemed congregation that if they would walk in His ways and keep His statutes, He would bless them in every way. He would fight their enemies, feed them and guide them. However, if they did not obey, he promised to bring terror over them, disease, fever, hunger, defeat, and slavery. Even then, if they would repent from their wickedness, he would remember his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And let's not lose sight of those promises. Abraham was promised that his descendants would have a land to call their own. Abraham was promised that from his descendants a great nation would rise. And Abraham was promised that through his seed all mankind would be blessed. Let's, let's 
not forget those. God was separating this people to preserve a lineage, a lineage of Abraham's offspring by which all nations would be blessed. The seed would not only become the final atoning sacrifice, but also our perfect high priest, liberating the Jews from the burdens of the old law and giving all nations a new covenant. Our next section here, Christ our High Priest and our Atoning Sacrifice. We're asked the questions, or we've got some questions here. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the High Priest would enter into the Most Holy Place behind the veil and approach the Ark of the Covenant, which had the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. From Hebrews 9 5. He would enter with blood of bulls and goats to make atonement for himself and the people. Unfortunately, the blood of animals could never take away sins, so the priest had to continually offer these sacrifices year after year. And we, we looked at Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4. Christ became our offering and sacrifice to God as we're, uh, for a sweet smelling aroma, uh, as we're told in Ephesians 5.2. And as you remember, as we went through all these sacrifices, that was the way the sacrifice was described, as a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. Search the scriptures, read Hebrews 9.11. Uh, through 15 and then answer the following question. Who came as a high priest of a more perfect tabernacle, not of this creation? And it was Christ. With whose blood did he enter the most holy place? His own blood. Number three, what kind of redemption did he obtain an eternal redemption, not something that had to be dealt with on a yearly basis, a, an eternal redemption. Number four, what does the blood of Christ cleanse? Okay, our sins from a 914, it says, your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. Number five, of what covenant is he, Christ, the mediator? The new covenant, the New Testament. Okay, and, number, and then number six, what kind of promise may we now receive? Okay, the promise of an eternal inheritance. Christ is the sacrifice for us. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world uh, was John's statement when Jesus came to be baptized. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And our high priest, who with his own blood entered the most holy place once and for all, from Hebrews 9, 12. He was not of the tribe of Levi, for he is not a priest to the Jews, but he is a priest for all who chose to be baptized into his death and be raised to walk in the newness of life. And we're referred to Romans 6, verses uh, 1 through 5. Uh, I'd like us to look at verses 1 through 7 here briefly. Romans 6, verses 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, 
so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Through obedience to him, through obedience to Christ, we become priests who now offer up spiritual sacrifices. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Let's see here. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 reads, For also as living stones, for, I'm sorry, you also as living stones are being, being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then verse 9, and I added verse 10 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. At the time of Jesus' crucifixion, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. Matthew 27, 51. Furthermore, we are told that Christ's very flesh was the veil. Christ put an end to the old law in his death, and the veil of separation between man and God is no longer bearing our, ex our access from Colossians 2, 14. As our high priest, he is our mediator under the new covenant so that we may approach the throne of God through him. And one more section here of search the scriptures. I realize we're running a little bit long, but let's, let's go ahead and finish it up. Number one, how long will Christ's sacrifice last? Forever, for all time. Number two, what did he do after he offered himself? Sat down at the right hand of God. Number three, where can we now enter with confidence? The holy place in the presence of God. How is the veil compared to Christ? Okay, his flesh. By the blood of Jesus we have confidence to enter the holy place through his flesh. The veil was removed. We have access to God. What is to be sprinkled clean from an evil conscience? Our hearts. Number six, what is to be washed with pure water? Okay, our bodies. Number seven. How are we to encourage one another? Okay, by loving good works. How else? Okay, by assembling together. By not abandoning our own meeting together. All right. Read Hebrews 10, uh, 13 through 16, and then answer the following questions. Uh, number, or number eight, where did Jesus suffer? Well, outside the gates from verse 12. What sacrifice are we, continue, are we to continually offer? Okay, our praise to God. A sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, praising his name, and we do that through prayer. And then with what other sacrifices uh, is God well pleased? Doing good. Doing good and sharing. 
and, um, and forget not, okay? The lesson closes with, with this passage from Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I'll just go back to that last verse because it's, it's so important. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet he was without sin. That, that concludes the lesson. Uh, thank you for your patience and your help. Uh, let's be prepared, Lord willing, to uh, study Lesson 8 Sunday morning uh, on the Bi and during the Bible class. Uh, also on Sunday morning, uh, uh, Jeff Himmel will be in town visiting, uh, and he will, be, uh, he will be preaching on Sunday morning. Again, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your help. Uh, uh, if there's nothing else at this time, Billy, you're going to lead us in a closing prayer. All right.